Today is the one year anniversary of Dead Rabbit Radio. Unless you're listening to this episode any day other than June 14th, and then in that case, it's just any other episode. But no, you're wrong, Calendar. It's not just any other episode. Because today, I'm going to take... I've done personal ghost stories before, but we're going to do some personal true crime stories, some little nuggets from my past that won't get me fired from any job I've worked at or arrested or beaten up by (laughs) co-conspirators. There's a lot of little mechanisms to that one. Then, we'll take a look at another paranormal story of mine that actually is a little bridge to a larger story. And then... I want to talk about some of the conspiracy theories that I have absolutely no proof, but I have a hunch. I have a hunch that they may be true. So today, we look at Jason's paranormal conspiracy and true crime stories on Dead Rabbit Radio. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Dead Rabbit Radio. Another episode, this is the first annual episode of Dead Rabbit Radio. Not first annual, this is the first anniversary, the one year anniversary episode of Dead Rabbit Radio. And I'm your host, Jason Carpenter, I'm having a great day. Hope you guys are having a great day too. We got a lot to cover here, so we're going to kind of jump right into it. Plus I'm recording it later than I normally do. Crazy day, man. Crazy day, crazy hot. Had to work, had to go to play practice. (sighs) I'm exhausted. It's like 9 o'clock at night. You know, it's funny. I've said this before in past episodes, but there are days when I struggle to get episodes put together in time, and I'm just like, oh my God, I got I'm starting this so late. I should have done this earlier. And there's like this total struggle and this stress, and then the episode is recorded, and it just becomes one of a number of episodes that people can listen to. Recommend this show to your friends, guys. But I mean that as there are going to be days you go through at work or at school, and you're like, oh my God, this is the worst day This project sucks. I'm not getting this paper done on time. But eventually that day will pass and that will just be another paper you wrote. Like you, all the struggle that you're putting into writing that paper, six months from now, you won't even remember you wrote that paper. Or you'll stumble across it and you'll be like, oh, I kind of had a hard time writing that paper. But you move on. We so often get, as I'm getting ready to record this episode all day long, I'm like, I'm so tired and I still have to record and edit an episode. What am I going to do when I'm going through this mental struggle? And after I record it, and after I edit it, I probably will never remember any of that, except that now I've recorded it. So when I listen to it, I'll be like, oh yeah, I was having kind of a bad day that day. Push through it, it just becomes a memory. The biggest obstacle in your life, once you're over it, it is a memory. It is done. Remember that, guy. So... Let's go ahead, though, and get started here. Now, again, like I said in the beginning, my true crime stories, I got a lot, I got a lot of them, but I don't want to go around just saying a bunch of stuff I did because this is a public forum, and I never murdered anybody. I never raped anybody. Never said anything. I did set something on fire, but that was an accident. Like, I obviously have standards. I don't steal from my employers, stuff like that. I'm glad how it goes, rape, murder. I think people who steal from their employers are super tacky. Like, that is... It's not up there with rape and murder, but when you steal from your employer, that really is just like, I get it, listen, man, you're taking staples or stuff like that, you know, scotch tape, but when you work for a retail establishment, which I've worked retail pretty much my entire life, retail or customer service, we deal with a lot of thieves, a lot of um, in-house thievery, and it's always super disappointing, and it sucks. Don't do it, guys. But anyway, so, oh yeah, so no, I never stole nothing. (laughs) That's where I was going with that. Never stole anything from anyone that I worked for. So... But let's talk about some some safe for work uh, Jason crime stories. And these are all super benign, really, except for the people they're happening to. And I'm really probably just focus on one or two. I remember one, what I consider my first. I'm a vandal. That was always my specialty. I was a creative vandal. And I was basically like a merc for hire in the town of Antelope, which is in the Sacramento area. You had like Antelope, North Highlands, Orangevale, Citrus Heights was kind of my stomping grounds. And I was a merc for hire. Now, you didn't have to pay me anything. I just enjoyed causing havoc. But I learned really quickly. We talked about this uh, when I was a couple episodes. I talked about losing a lot of weight. I've been in a, I've been, I won't say I've been in a lot of fights, but I've been in enough fights to know that they're not the best thing to be in regularly, especially as you get older. And I realized something. When I don't like someone and I confront them head on, I've now made an enemy that when I go certain places, I may run into this person and we may have an altercation. I learned 
very, very quickly that I can have the same satisfaction of beating someone and them never knowing where the attack came from. Because it would happen to me. My stuff would get vandalized. My stuff would get stolen. And there's this outrage when it comes out of the blue. So I began vandalizing stuff with a purpose. I was basically a superhero whose superpower was not getting caught being a dick to other people's property. My first case of vandalism was... When my dad was the pastor of a church, there was a parishioner. Churches are really weird because there's a super bizarre power structure that goes on behind the scenes. That's the reason I don't go to actual churches. It's not because I've walked away from the faith. It's because I'm tired of all the BS behind the scenes. So there was like a deacon's wife or something like that who wanted to paint the bathrooms. And my dad was like, I don't really think the bathrooms need to be painted. But she really wanted to. And it was basically like a power play. My dad's like, fine, paint the bathrooms. She painted the, the girls' restroom like mauve or something. I don't know. And she painted the boys' bathroom purple. My dad's like, God damn it, purple's a girl's color. No, he didn't care about the color. He cared that she painted the toilet seat purple. And he's like, you know, people are going to pee all over this. Like, this is going to get stained. And I remember him going like, who has a purple, who has a painted toilet seat to begin with? Like, it's just going to get super gross super fast. And my dad is a savvy man. And he knew if he just removed the toilet seat, and bought a new one, the woman would see him as making a power play. And it wasn't worth it to him. But he needed to get rid of that toilet seat. So I'm like probably 12 at this time. This is in Alameda. And we lived at the... Oh, yeah, I have a listener from Alameda. I think it's Merrick. Don't don't stop listening to the show if I get the name wrong, but I'm pretty sure it's Merrick. But I I don't have time to check. It's like 9.30, so I, I really hope it's you. But anyways... There is Alameda Baptist Church, and we lived in the parsonage next to it. There's a couple ghost stories from that. I'll tell those sometime. But we're in the house. I'm sitting in the house. My dad comes over, and he says, hey, Jason, I need your help with something. I'm like, okay. So we walk over into the church, and we go into the bathroom, and he goes, stand on the toilet seat. And I'm like, okay. And I'm a chubby little kid. I stand on the toilet seat. And he's looking at the toilet seat, and he's like, now do the twist. Like, do the twist. So I'm like... Huh? And he's like, just just dance around on the toilet seat. And I'm like, okay. So I start twisting on the toilet seat, and it goes, er, 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 <laughs> breaks. And he's like, thanks, Jason. And he takes the broken toilet seat, throws it away, goes to the store, gets a real toilet seat, and was able to say, oh, yeah, some kids are screwing around in there, and they broke the toilet seat, had to buy a new one. That's when I learned the power of vandalism. That was my super soldier serum. He got what he wanted. He told the truth. And I was like the little sneaky Bart Simpson character in the background going, (laughs) never forgot that feeling. As I got older, though, my vandalism became, became perfection. I remember once I walked into, like, not a Sam's Club, in they had a big grocery store called, like, Food Co. in Sacramento. And I was walking through one day. I was walking through, I, I can't remember the exact ingredients, but I remember walking through the aisles at Food Co. And I saw, you know, like, at supermarkets, they have the, like, the, they'll list what's in the aisle on the little hanging sign. It said, like, fish, like, canned fish, canned meat, cooking oils. And I said, oh, my God, this aisle was made for me. I, that's where all I have to do is my shopping. Because, see, my specialty was I wasn't just about throwing eggs, which I did do that. But I was about biological attacks. I wanted to throw fish guts at people. Not like, we did... We did cause random havoc sometimes, and I'm not proud of those moments, but when there was someone that I wanted to send a message to, but I didn't want them to know that I was the one sending that message, fish guts, bro. I would throw fish on people's roofs all the time. I think I'm responsible for, like, an entire generation of seagulls. Like, I'm technically their dad. I gave them so much food in the town of Antelope that they they must be, like, writing me... uh, like, sending me family photos for Christmas. Thanks for helping my family survive that year. Thanks for all the fish guts. Fish guts everywhere. It's throwing fish guts everywhere. And see, so, and I would, first off, I just started doing it for people that I didn't like. People that had wronged me in some And I know you're thinking, Jason, you're, oh, you're so lame. Why don't you go and fight these people? Well, again, one, I don't want to box people all the time. Like, sometimes I just want to go get a pizza. Like, if I box this dude... Because I don't like something his girlfriend said. I'm going to have to fight him every single time I see him. Or somebody could be like, yo, 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 what's up? (laughs) I'm obviously from the 80s and I'm a rapper, yo. And I'm like, I hate that. So then I could basically just find... Technically, it's the thinking man's revenge. Because I have to do a lot of homework. I have to find out where you live. I have to find out what room you sleep in. I have to find out what hours you keep. Cars and stuff like that. I got to figure out all this stuff. Got to figure out... Dude, I would broke it down to a science, man. 
30 seconds in and out. 30 seconds was actually an extremely long amount of time. Because sometimes I would bring people with me. I'd say, 10 seconds, we're out. And they're like, 10 seconds, I can do so much more. I'm like, dude, 10 seconds, because we're going to make a lot of noise. And I don't want this coming back on me. But eventually, I did become a mercenary where people would say, hey, you know, this guy dumped me. Can you help me out? And I would all give this speech all the time. I'd give this speech. I'd say, listen, I can help. This is going to sound overly dramatic, but this is all stuff that I learned from doing this stuff in the past. I'd say, listen, I can help you, but here are my rules. No women, no children. No, just joking. I had no problem with destroying a chick's house. I said this. This is what we're going to do. I'm not going to do anything for three months. I'm not going to do anything for three months. And they'd be like, well, he, and I was like, this is why. The, po- the reason why you came to me is because you don't want to get back to you. You can just go to his house right now and bash his windows in, right? You have to wait. Because the point of doing this is them never knowing. They may suspect it was you, but the chances of you being retaliated against... And when I say retaliated against, when I say get in fistfights, I'm basically... That, those are euphemisms for getting your head blown off. Because again, we're in Sacramento. It's not like... When I say I don't want to fight a guy at the pizza parlor, that's true. I don't want to fist fight him. But I also don't want to get like blown away because I was mad at something his girlfriend said. Like you just you have to you have to make smart decisions. The smartest decision is to not have such a volatile temper like I did when I was younger. But so anyways, I'd say, listen, I'm not going to do anything for three months at all. I'm not going to do anything for three months. That'll give everything time to die down. He may suspect you had something to do with it, but. People rarely will retaliate if they just suspect it. So much time will pass that they probably won't put two and two together. Two, I'm never going to tell you I'm going to do it. And I'll never tell you after it happened. You may at some point down the road hear that something bad happened to that person. But you won't know if I did it. So you have no guilty conscience at all. Because those are all things that I learned. I've done stuff right after the fact, like punch the dude in the face and then it's this whole thing. Or I've done stuff and told the person, was bragging about it, and they felt bad. They had trolls remorse, so then they went and tried to apologize to the person and it was this whole thing. So, you come to me, I'm going to wait at least three months, and then I'm never going to talk about it. And you are you may know something happened to him, but you won't know if I did that. It could have just been a random neighborhood psychopath. <laughs> That super glued his doors locked or through fish guts. I guess fish guts was kind of my signature, but through fish guts and roofs. But yeah, fish guts was just one piece of my arsenal. I basically created biological. I created some of the most dis- foulest smells outside of feces. I don't think I ever used feces, but I created some of the foulest smells possible to launch at residences and pour in automobiles. And that is, that is probably the only, those are probably the only true crime stories I'm willing to share in a public forum. Just petty vandalism stuff. I'm not going to sit here and brag and be like, and you know I did so much more because I'm a big tough guy. I mean, I just think those stories are fairly funny. And again, I was, it was, looking back on it, it, it would be quite infuriating, but, if it happened to me, but, but, every single person I did that to totally deserved it. Totally deserved it. Trust me. I'm not... Everyone who I did that to, it was in a very nice neighborhood. The people in the neighborhood weren't doing nice things. So if you came out and there was fish guts on your roof, you deserved to get fish guts on your roof. I'm sorry. So anyways, let's go ahead. And as the lone rabbit, like, and I'm standing on a other roof looking down at him with my big dead rabbit costume going like, yes, the darkness comes to all, but the fish guts come to some. I mean, that might I can't sound overly dramatic, but still would have been cool. That's my true crime story. Let's see how much of that stays in the editing process. Let's go ahead and move on to... Th- th- this is the thing. Let's talk about some conspiracies that I think may be possible, but I have no proof of it. I have no proof of it. So basically, it's me just shooting from the hip. These are things I've thought about before, but and they're weird. They're weird ones, but I really... It was like, I don't know how to even go about researching this. First conspiracy theory... And this kind of falls into a paranormal type conspiracy theory. But the first one is this. Um, I think... (laughs) I've only said this out loud to maybe two people. I think Seth MacFarlane may have made a deal with the devil. Seth MacFarlane, if you don't know, is the creator of Family Guy. And Family Guy came out on Fox. It didn't do very well. It got canceled. And he just kind of drifted away into obscurity. 
And then he was supposed to fly on, I think, Flight 77, one of the 9-11 fl- planes. He was supposed to fly on a plane that day, and he didn't. He got delayed. And then the planes obviously crashed. I don't think I have to tell the rest of the story. 9-11, people are like, what? What happened on 9-11? You know, planes crashed, a bunch of buildings came down. So, and then he ends up, the family guy gets renewed on Fox. So, but, and I'm not saying that he made a deal with, let me clarify here. I'm not saying that he made a deal with the devil and and he caused 9-11 by his deal. I don't think that was his human sacrifice or anything. But I, I I always thought that was an interesting detail that he avoided that fate. But he had the cartoon, it got canceled, and then he kind of just kind of drifted around. You never really heard of him much. And then I think Family Guy got syndicated on TBS, and then Fox brought it back. It might have got syndicated on Cartoon Network, one of the two. But Fox brings back Family Guy. Now, that isn't unusual in and of itself. That's happened with other shows. What's unusual is you have this guy who basically appeared out of nowhere, came out with a cartoon, it failed... Then comes back out of nowhere, gets the cartoon back on the air, gets two more cartoons on the air, hosts the Oscars, is dating some chick from Game of Thrones, which that's really, I don't really care about that, and then gets his dream project, basically he's doing Star Trek fan fiction now in the guise of the Oroville. He is either the, he, here's the thing, I like Seth MacFarlane as a person, I don't think he's incredibly talented. Like, I think that he's funny, but he's not... I remember once he did a live musical... It was like an hour and a half long musical concert with him and Lois from uh, Family Guy singing, like, Torch songs, singing Sinatra songs. And I'm like, why is this on the air? Why is this on the air? Him hosting the Oscars. You're like, this is a travesty. And I hate the Oscars. And he's making these movies. Now, again, I think he's funny, but... I don't understand the return on investment for him. Like, basically, like, yeah, he's funny, and he comes out with... It seems like for every hit, he has a flop. He's really a 50-50 kind of guy. Family guy, and then he then he has American Dad, which I actually liked better, but it wasn't as big, and then The Cleveland Show was a flop, so that's kind of a two-for-one. I guess, actually, that's interesting. Maybe it's two-for-one. Maybe he has two hits and a flop. But, so I guess that is a pretty good return on investment. But I always got the idea that here was a guy who basically came from nowhere and got a cartoon on Fox, which, you know, because of The Simpsons, Fox was looking for cartoons. But the show didn't do well. It gets canceled. And then it comes back, and it's not only bigger than ever, he's basically given the keys to the Fox kingdom to the point where they're like, hey, you want to dress up and we're going to... I can understand animation. It's cheap, but we're going to make a sci-fi show where you pretend to be a Starfleet... I mean, a space captain... And get to fly around. And I think this is just the beginning. Like, I really feel like if anyone, if there's any proof that someone's made a deal with the devil, it's Seth MacFarlane. I can't prove it. And it's not necessarily something I'd want to prove. Because I, I, I would be nice if that wasn't true. He seems like a decent guy. Just extremely lucky. More luck than talent. Again, he's funny. I'm not trying to knock him. But you know what I mean? Like, there's people, there are people who seem... Are, who are just extremely talented people. And they're just, I'll say like someone like Dave Chappelle, who you're like, this guy just, just knocks it out of the park every single time. From his, I was reading about, I'm reading, that's what of a nerd I am. I was reading about Half the Bake today. And I'm like, really? Like for that movie to come out, he just knocked it out of the park. And then he has a television show, knocks it out of the park. So now he had like some pilots and stuff like that that didn't work for him. But he just kept, he just like really knocks it out of the park each time. And there are other comedians like that comedic talents like that i just don't think seth mcfarland's one of them so i don't know deal with the devil that's a conspiracy theory i have but i can't prove here's a controversial one sandy hook uh, let me say this i believe sandy hook happened i believe the children really died and i believe that adam lanza was the shooter i don't believe any conspiracies that are saying that it's fake or there was other shooters stuff like that still in that realm i always had a sneaking suspicion that the sandy hook shootings were related to 2012 into the world it happened seven days before december 21st 2012 it happened on december 14th 2012 i always felt that those two were connected in some way not saying that it was some sort of ancient curse or anything like that i personally think because we've never been able to figure out a a motive for adam lanza we haven't really been able to find any writings or why he did it his this is my theory 
They had a bunch of guns because I think that they were survivalist type people. They were definitely, him and his mom lived there. I think his dad was out of the picture. He was around, but I don't think he was he was with them at the time. But anyways, they had a safe full of guns. That's where he got his guns. I believe they were probably prepper survivalist type of people. And all this 2012 nonsense got in his head and he thought it was the end of the world anyways. It, I, 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 it's one of those things that I can't prove. Nobody can prove, but I, I had a, the timing was just too good or slash bad because of what happened. But I think the Sandy Hook shootings are related to 2012 in some way. And again, I'm not saying it's some sort of that was the prophecy. The minds foretold the destruction was actually the destruction. I'm not saying anything like that. I'm saying that I think that is, was the motive or possibly the motive of Adam Lanza was he thought the world was ending anyways. The world was going to end in seven days. The whole cycle would be complete and everything would be destroyed. Why not go out with a bang? Or he could also be thinking, I'm going to spare these children, my mom and myself, the suffering of the 13 fictional gods (laughs) rampaging across the planet. I think it was connected. No one's ever made that connection. I've never heard any media reports about it. Um, everyone is panicked before, coming up to 2012, and I think that he was one of them, and he took it out in a fatal, fatal way. No proof of that. Just a conspiracy theory, I believe. And again, that's one of those things, like, I don't even know how to research that. I guess, I mean, if he had those books, but see, we don't have copies of any of that stuff. So I think 2012 and uh, Sandy Hook were related in a belief system, possibly a motive. But let's go ahead and end it with this, with a ghost story. A true ghost story, ghost story that happened to me. This would have been back in 98, 97. It was was before the time of the Shadow People invasion, which I talked about quite a few episodes ago. And I was driving through Orangevale, as I was wont to do in my... What was I driving then? I I wasn't driving the Mustang. I think I was driving the Renault State. No, I would have been... hmm. Anyways, it doesn't matter. But just imagine it was the Jason Jalopy. I would drive around with my buddies. We'd go ghost hunting. And I've told stories about us going ghost hunting before. The charred pants story on the on the Lost episode is one of those. But this time I was driving alone. Now, I was driving through the back streets of Orangevale. It's probably about 3 in the morning. Now, Orangevale, if you don't know, is notable for basically three things in the 90s. Meth, skinheads, and uh, no streetlights. Very rural area. Especially when you're going down the side street. Dude, we had such a skinhead population. This is no joke. We had such a skinhead population in Orangeville. I went to, this is 100% true. I went to see American History X at the theater opening weekend. And I just went to by myself because I go to theaters by myself all the time. You know that scene, that movie, if you don't know what the movie is, it's about white supremacists. That scene where Edward Norton takes his shirt off and he has the swastika on his chest and he's playing basketball against all the black guys and he's beating them at basketball. The audience was cheering like we were watching Rudy. They were like, yeah, dunk on him, dunk. And I'm like, oh my God, dude. This is a movie about, the. this is like a meditation on racism and the human condition and what it means to like be a human. And they're like, yeah, they were, they, they were cheering. Now, to be fair, they didn't cheer during the curb stomping scene, but there was a couple of mm, like, yeah, like right on type motions. And to be even more fair to this crowd of skinheads, when the movie ended, you could hear a pin drop and everyone shuffled out of the theater quietly. Like, that is a really powerful movie and it was very interesting to see it with a bunch of people who shared similar views as Edward Norton's character. That's kind of the the area Orangevale is in. It's known for meth, pecker woods, and no streetlights. So I'm driving down these back roads of Orangevale. Really nice place to live, though. All aside of the fightings and the meth cooking and the mysterious fish gut bandit. They never did catch that guy. I'm driving through Orangeville late at night, three in the morning or something like that. And, you know, it starts off, you think, maybe I'm just tired. Maybe I'm just tired. But I'm driving by a creek and it was this weird, like, creek that kind of came to where the road was and then turned and ran along. Like, it was like running... Uh, what, what what perpendicular means it's running alongside, or is that parallel? Anyways, just imagine the, the stream is running. To, it's so hot in here, guys. You have no idea all my fans are up. The water's coming like it's going to hit the road, and then it turns and then begins to follow the road. So I'm driving to where I know this creek is, and I, I know that's what it looked like because I went out there during the day. But this night, it was one of my many nights driving alone, just thinking. And I look in front of me, The only thing that's lighting anything up are my headlamps. 
And I look in front of me, and for a split second, I see... God damn it, dude. I can see... I, I see what looked like... Ooh, it didn't look like it. What was a ghost boy? It was probably a boy around... It's weird because through the course of the story, I'd feel like the ghost was around 10, but he probably was a bit taller than that. But he was all blue, not like cool Smurf blue or Eiffel 65 blue, but he was basically like a translucent person, but you could see the blue outline of him to the point that I could draw you a picture of what his shirt pocket looked like. Like, every detail of his shirt was illuminated in blue. His face was... I can picture it while I'm talking about it. That's why I hesitated to mention it. His face was in blue. His hair was in blue. You could see individual lines in the hair. You could see his shirt. He had a collared shirt, like a long sleeve collared shirt that was kind of like a Wrangler or like a cowboy type shirt that was unbuttoned slightly. Had the um, pocket... Had the chest pocket with the little silver type button. You know, like, it's not like the little button with the little holes in it. It's kind of like the silvery button. He's standing right in front of my car, and I hit him. But it's a ghost. So, what are you going to do? But, as I drew, I didn't realize really what was going on until my car was kind of halfway through him. And then, I went to look in my mirror to see, you know, what I, if I, what I had hit was standing behind me now in the road. If I was just imagining the whole thing or what. And when I looked in the rearview mirror, this spirit was in the back seat of my car. The blue boy. The blue boy was one of the first. He actually, it's hard, it's always hard to remember how everything played out. But I told, I told the story during the Shadow People invasion where I saw the little boy who was like the black silhouette running around in my grandma's living room. The blue boy showed up after him, but before the Shadow People. Before I started seeing the full-on Shadow People. Now, the little boy, the silhouette that was running around my grandma's living room. I had a horrible dream last night about my grandparents. I dreamt that they died. But the thing is, is that they've been dead for years. But I remember just sobbing in my dream, sobbing in my dream. I'll never have a place to go in Sacramento again. I've lost my home. I'll never be able to go back. I love my grandparents. I love them. But they passed away a couple years ago. It's just an odd dream to have. So, anyways, at my grandma's house, they had the little silhouette boy running around. And then they had the shadow people. And I've talked about the shadow people. I said they were almost ambivalent. They almost were too smart to care about humans. I never felt either anger or scariness from them. The blue boy was straight up malevolent. That was the one spirit that I ran into constantly that I actively feared. Actively feared. To the point, what's odd about it is that I blocked out a lot of stuff that happened with that guy. A lot of stuff. Because I've said this before. There have been times where I've told people, like people have said, hey, remember when this happened? Like when I fought the witch. And I was like, what are you, I never fought a witch. And they told me a little bit about it. And I go, oh yeah, I fought a witch. And I'll tell a story that's not a tease. I'll tell a story someday. But people would reference the blue boy to me. And I'd be like, what are you talking about? And they're like, remember you said this incident happened with the blue boy? I'm like, oh my God, I totally forgot about that. To this point, to this day, I basically have three memories of the blue boy. One, the time I hit it. One, and I, I, for weeks I had this feeling like this guy was stalking me. So I feel like I have memories that I've repressed. Because I was in a state of anxiety because I felt like he was everywhere around me. But I remember once I was having a meeting. I worked at Godfather's Pizza in Antelope. I had a meeting with my manager, the assistant manager, and my friend Josh. And we're standing out in the middle of Godfather's Pizza. And as we're talking, I see, so there's like, we're in, it's gone now. It's too bad because that was a cool hangout spot. But there's Godfather's Pizza. Like you had like the dining room area and then it kind of broke off to this hallway that would go to the bathrooms. And I remember I was sitting there having a meeting with, we were really just BS and it wasn't like an official meeting, but I'm talking to them and I look to where like the corner is of the hallway. So it's like, oh, see, I do. I just remember, okay, see, this is, I haven't talked about the blue boy in probably like 15 years. I remember now why I was concerned, why, because, so let me tell you a little bit more of that story. I remember as I was talking to management, I was staring at the hallway. And then I started thinking, why was I staring at the hallway? This is why I was staring at the hallway, because previous to that, maybe in a couple days before that, I remember I was in the Godfather's restroom. I don't remember all the details, but I was in the Godfather's restroom. 
And the boy was in there. I saw the boy in the restroom. Late at night, and I left. And I remember telling my friend Jackie about the blue boy, and I was totally freaked out, and I felt like he was following me around and all that stuff. So I remember I didn't want to go into the restroom in there, so I was peeing in the walk-in freezer. No, I wasn't doing that, but I did a lot of bad stuff there, but not that. But anyways, I remember, see, it's like just fragments of memories. I remember telling Jackie, I don't want to go in the bathroom. There's something in there. But anyways, I was having this meeting with these people, and I remember kind of looking past their shoulders at the hallway that led down the to the restrooms, and I'm like, looking at it and I see the little blue boy like from the moment he peeks around the corner to the moment he's in front of me is like a split second like I see his head start to move around the corner and then he runs so fast within a second he's standing in front of me and he just makes this horrible like disfigured face at me like oh And I screamed out loud. And I actually had a physical reaction. And I just kind of... (gasps) And I remember... I didn't breathe in like that. I screamed out loud. And my bosses were like... My bosses were like, what? What's going on? And I didn't say anything. I said, I gotta go home, dude. I don't feel good at all. Like, I basically had a full-on hallucination of whatever this thing was. Again, the memory's spotty. But I do have one other memory of this thing. And it's not necessarily of the Blue Boy itself. But what I did to stop it. Now, I've said a lot of stupid stuff on this podcast, but this might take the cake. And when I say just this podcast, I don't mean this episode. A lot of stupid stuff just on the run of the podcast to begin with. Um, So I don't know why it got into my head, but I came up with an idea. That, this is so stupid sounding. If you take a piece of your soul, if any of this stuff exists... If you, t- if you take a piece of your soul, if your soul is the highest form of energy, the highest form of you in existence, your body is just a meat wagon for your soul. You can take a piece of your soul, break a piece of it off, and turn it into a weapon. Do I have any proof of that? No. I don't know where I got that idea from. I just felt that it was true. And the problem was is that you're basically trading a piece of yourself To turn it into something that you can use offensively. I mean, you can make a shield as well. We'll get to that later. But you break off a piece of your essence. I used to be, you know, and I guess I should say this now. I used to be like into astral travel, all that stuff. Those are, again, far more episodes to do in the future. We'll talk about doing astral travel. I used to be really, like I said before, I used to be really into conspiracy theories. I was not skeptical of conspiracy theories at all. I was the same thing for all the paranormal stuff. Like, I really believed all of it. I was really into all sorts of weirdness. Stuff like that. Not Wiccan weirdness. I never went down that path, but I was just into like all sorts of all sorts of wacky beliefs that now I look back on and go, ah, oh, it's probably just daydream, it's probably just imagination. This stuff doesn't work, anything like that. So I'm gonna forget what I just saw out of the corner of my eye, and we're gonna go ahead and keep recording this episode. So, but I had this theory. If you take a piece of your soul. And you basically break it off. You could create a weapon that would protect you. Why your soul would protect you, I don't know. But I believe that it could, and it did. I mean, if any of this is true, and I'm not just like, have, I wasn't just having seizures and imagining all this stuff, and which is 100% possible. It was all my imagination. 100% possible. But anyways, through visualization, through astral travel whatever you want to call it i came to the conclusion i feel like such an idiot talking about this stuff but i was able to remove a small piece of my soul and i made a sword out of it and because it was all about visualization and actually that's an now that i say that out loud that's interesting because it could just be the the act i always talk about visualization and positive thinking and stuff like that The act of visualizing this, whether or not I took a piece of my soul out, is probably irrelevant. The fact that I was visualizing it, and visualization is magic in a sense. You're reshaping the physical world through your mental thoughts. That could be that could explain what you know how this all worked. But anyways, take a piece of my soul. Human souls I always saw as translucent blue. So mine is, yours is, everyone's is, and that's why the boys was as well. That's their natural state. 
I took a piece of my soul and I forged an ornate sword in my mind. Now, I knew the sword didn't actually exist. I'm not saying that I <laughs> carried it around on a sheath. But I knew on some level, or I believed on some level that it did. On some plane outside of our own. And But the, here's the thing. The trade-off was is that now I have this offensive weapon to protect myself from ghosts. But it's a part of me that probably I shouldn't have taken out. Because it's part of your soul. You only get one of those throughout all of eternity. But the boy, the threat of the boy forced me to do it. It wasn't the shadow people. It wasn't the shadow dogs. It wasn't any of the other nonsense going on in my life. The threat of the blue boy. who And, and the, the from the time I saw him to that Godfather story. Was at least five or six months of constant issues with him. That I've just blocked out. And after that Godfather story, I would say it would probably went on for another two or three months. Because at that point, we were now in the story of the Shadow Invasion people. And I also had to deal with this stupid little blue bastard running around, scaring me. Standing behind me, doing creepy stuff. So because of the threat of him interrupting my daily life, I forged this sword. Or I believed I forged this sword. I'm not making it up now. This, All this stuff, all of these events happen whether or not you believe that they happened or that I was just imagining them. I experienced these. And again, I can't say for a hundred percent. I could never say that what I, I I'll say I saw these things, but if you could say, these are the reason, these are the logical reasons why you saw these things. I would go, okay. But anyways, I forged the sword. So I have this thing now. And that's the end of the story. That's the problem sometimes when you tell these stories, when you tell personal ghost stories. Something happened, but I don't remember what. I remember there was a point where I had the sword, and then the blue boy was no more. I don't know if I confronted him. I don't know if he tried to get me and I summoned this sword this mental sword again i wasn't carrying around but i took a piece of myself and mentally had it separate basically a tulpa actually and now is a good way to put it created this sword i don't did he show up and i cleave him in half with it did he know that i have it and never came back that doesn't sound like him he was so malevolent he had such a good time freaking me out that it i don't think anything could have scared him the blue boy just disappeared Not disappeared in the sense that he's gone, but disappeared in the sense that the threat was over. And I'm not, I'll tell you, uh, so he disappeared. Now I do know that I, I had, there had been times where I had encountered other ghostly things. Because I was just seemed to be a magnet for it for a while. And that sword I created in my mind from my soul seemed to just cut them right in half. Golden ribbons is what it would look like. Golden ribbons. Sometimes they'd be translucent blue. Sometimes they'd be dark silhouettes. Sometimes it would just be a feeling in the house, but I could mentally, in my mind, cleave them in half, cut them, eviscerate them. Golden ribbons, and then they would disappear. The sword that I created, the Tulpa Mind Thoughts Form Sword, from a piece of my soul. This sounds so insane. But it worked. It worked for me, at least. But the thing with forging a sword like that, like I said before, it's from something very important. Something you can't lose. But I don't have that sword anymore. It got replaced when someone gave me another one. But we'll talk about that on another episode of Dead Rabbit Radio. Dead Rabbit Radio at gmail.com is going to be our email address. You can also hit us up at facebook.com slash Dead Rabbit Radio. Twitter is at Jason O. Carpenter. Dead Rabbit Radio is the daily paranormal conspiracy and true crime podcast. You don't have to listen to it every day, but I'm glad you listened to it today. Thank you for listening, dude. It's been a year. This has been awesome. We're just going to keep on going. 
I love you guys. Thank you so much. Have a great one.